Welcome to Bible Study for Progressives, a show where moderates, liberals, and leftists of all faiths and ideologies come together to discuss scripture, spirituality, and politics. We engage scripture in its historical context, plumb its depths for wisdom and guidance, and apply its lessons to current events and social issues. Whether you're a liberal evangelical, a New Age spiritualist, a social justice activist, or a postmodern theologian, there's something in this show for you. Come, be energized in spirit and mind to understand the word and what it means to be a spiritual person in today's world. Okay, so obviously I'm in complete disagreement with everything. Um, the excessive negativity about our institutions, about Christianity, about America is objectionable to me. And the when and to take the political out of the text is a travesty for social justice. Okay, when Jesus is saying to the commission to the nations, he's not necessarily talking about individual people, right? He's talking about groups of people. And I would add that what he's talking about are actual nations too, that those are included in the definition of the word ethne and that they can also be a part of the definition of what this passage means. It's not about personal salvation. It's about bringing the nations, bringing the, na the world, justice to the world. So what have you done? but remove all of politics or most of politics from Christianity with your revisions of the, of the text. And the idea that now Christianity is just about personal things and not about justice anymore. And so we, we want to hold on to our resentments Hold on to our grievances, but this is 2020. It's not the 1400s. It's not the 1600s. It's not the 1800s. There's really very limited effect on the present that is being here, being really revealed here. We are in a struggle to save our democracy. And part of the problem is not only fascist propaganda on the left, but anti-American propaganda or fascist propaganda on the right, anti-American propaganda on the left. So not only are we excessively negative, wishing to hold on to our grievances and not really participate, we are robbing the Bible of its political context. This is about the authorities. This is about the powers. This is about the rulers of this world. This is not about kingdom, getting along, having some wonderful community where we all love each other. No, that's not what it's about. And, I re and I, I've been working very hard, and I, res I resent the fact that you have failed to create a liberal Christian political theology and have brought non-Christian ideology into the church. And that Christian non-Christian ideology is insufficient to make way for redemption and to make way for inclusion. And so, wrong direction. We should be going towards justice in our interpretations of scripture 
towards the power, turning to Walter Wink, turning to people who see in scripture a way and a means to um, salvation or liberation. So, and not denigrating scripture, denigrating the church, denigrating um, our nation, denigrating religion, and making it out to be this terrible, horrible thing when the reality is, and the truth is, our history is mixed. Thank you, Richard, um, for your um, sharing, which definitely there's a lot to think about in what you said. Um, and um, I would just like to say that I do think it's possible to separate out, you know, um, some of the technical disagreements that you voiced from, you know, um, the wholesale critique. And, um, you know, I, I would like to um, uh, invite all of us to do that. The war in Ukraine has entered a new phase of brutality as Russia seems to be targeting civilians trying to flee their country. This is a moment for leadership. Pregnant women and children have become the latest victims of this war. This is a moment for strength. Russia expands its war to every part of Ukraine, striking a military base less than 15 miles from the Polish border. This is a moment for wisdom and experience. Be not afraid. This is a moment to strengthen alliances. Never, ever give up hope. This is a moment for courage. Never doubt. This is a moment for compassion. Never tire. This is a moment for truth over propaganda. It will not be easy. This is a moment for one president. There will be cost. America's president. This is the task of our time. This is a moment for President Joe Biden. Be not afraid. In this final section of the story, Matthew brings us to the other side of Jesus' martyrdom, the resurrection. Back in 1973, Ernest Becker published his groundbreaking book, The Denial of Death which convincingly proposed that the human striving to deny death its power over us is the primary and fundamental struggle of societies and individuals. The gospel story, as told in Matthew, ends by addressing this primal struggle. Some scholars have suggested that this primal struggle against death was embedded in the purity codes of ancient Israel, and that death was the ultimate impurity and was, in fact, the organizing principle of the purity code. Matthew Thiessen, in his 2020 book, Jesus and the Forces of Death, convincingly argues that the Gospels portray Jesus consistently and successfully fighting the ultimate ritual impurity, the impurity of death, and that the resurrection is the ultimate triumph over this impurity. Death and the fear of death have also been said to be the ultimate weapons of empire and domination systems. For these reasons, the New Testament writers rejoiced in the resurrection of Jesus as the victory over death. In 1 Corinthians 15.55, Paul exclaims, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The closing chapters of the book of Revelation speak of death and Hades being thrown into a lake of fire. Then Revelation 21.4 declares, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. In this hope, in this faith, Jesus has called his disciples in Matthew to take up their crosses, because in this way they overcome the ultimate weapon of the empire and of the ruling classes. Through taking up the cross, they overcome the fear of death, and through resurrection, they will overcome death itself. And so Jesus says, Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Resurrection is the defeat of empire, the coming of the human one. My name is Bert Newton, and this is episode 67 of Bible Study, Parody and Subversion in Matthew's Gospel.
We begin with a couple of verses that close out the scene at the cross and transition us to the scene at the tomb. Let's read verses 55 to 56. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. In the last episode, we saw at the cross that Jesus was abandoned by the male disciples, the crowd, and even God. But now we find that the women are still there, albeit at a distance, but the women have not abandoned Jesus. These women, who have largely been left out of the gospel narrative, will suddenly be very prominent for the remainder of it. The NRSV says that the women provided for Jesus. I'm not sure why the NRSV translates it this way. It seems to be influenced by a similar passage in Luke 8 that says that some women supported Jesus out of their means. But Matthew isn't saying that. The Greek word being used here is diakoneo, which generally means to serve. It is the word from which we derive deacon. In the Gospel of Matthew, it is used to describe the activity of Jesus, angels, women, and hypothetical ideal disciples, the ones in the parable of the sheep and the goats, but never of actual male disciples. Jesus said it was the reason that he came, to serve. So it became so important a word in the early church that the deacon became a recognized office in the church as the church became hierarchical. Diakoneo can also be translated minister. So the women minister to Jesus. They are ministers. Although, of course, we need to remember that whatever a minister might mean, it did not have the religious connotations back then that it does today because religion was not a separate thing in antiquity. Perhaps we might think of them as government ministers in the new society. In the U.S., we tend to call them secretaries, such as the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Labor, and so forth. But of course, that has hierarchical implications, so that translation isn't really sufficient either. The point is that they were playing an important role that only Jesus, angels, and ideal disciples played. It's interesting that the mother of Zebedee's brothers is among them. She asked that her sons be seated at his right and his left when he came into his kingdom. Jesus responded by referring to his crucifixion, where there were two people on his right and left, same exact language. But the sons fled the crucifixion with the other male disciples. It was their mother who stayed with Jesus. A little ironic. Let's read verses 57 to 61. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Here we find out that a rich man can be a disciple of Jesus. The last time that we encountered a rich man, that rich man was unable to follow Jesus because he would not sell all that he had and distribute the proceeds to the poor. But if we remember that scene, Jesus did not require that of him at first. He told him only to follow some basic laws. It was only when the man pressed Jesus for more that Jesus said, If you wish to be perfect or complete, Go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But here we find that someone doesn't have to be perfect or complete to be a disciple. Someone can perhaps have a slower process than immediately liquidating assets to distribute the money to the poor. Yet what he does here takes courage. Warren Carter puts it this way. Guilt by association presumably one of the reasons the eleven fled, could bring about his own execution. His actions as a wealthy person of some social standing in providing a decent burial for a marginalized, crucified criminal is certainly unusual. Now, his wealth and social standing make it less risky for him than, perhaps, the peasant followers of Jesus. But it is still risky. He could have been arrested himself 
perhaps executed. He has leveraged his privilege, taking a risk, probably losing some honor in the process, to give Jesus an honorable burial. And then this rich man goes away, but two women remain. They are still with Jesus. Perhaps, unlike all the male disciples, they listened with ears to hear and are awaiting the resurrection. Let's continue with verses 62 to 66. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. The members of the Sanhedrin are afraid of a deception because that's what they would do. Remember, this is the body of leaders who circumvented the law to hold a kangaroo court where they looked not for the truth, but for false witnesses. They bribed one of the followers of Jesus and manipulated the crowd. They are dishonest, so they figure that the disciples of Jesus will be dishonest as well. Ironically, they set up a situation in which the resurrection will be that much harder to deny because it will happen with a sealed tomb and a guard of soldiers. Let's continue with chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The women, who keep coming back, who have never abandoned Jesus, even in death, are the first witnesses to the resurrection. Matthew says that they went to see the tomb. Warren Carter notes that the Gospel of Mark says that the women come with spices, hoping to anoint Jesus' dead body. But Matthew does not have them bringing spices, and simply says that they went to see the tomb. Matthew focuses on the women as witnesses. That is Matthew's framing. In Mark, they ask who will roll away the stone, but not here in Matthew. In Matthew, they come as witnesses to see. Carter notes that throughout this gospel, having eyes to see signifies understanding. Perhaps the women have understood Jesus and are coming in hope and faith to witness the resurrection. And that's exactly what they witness. There is a great earthquake, as there was at the crucifixion. The earthquake links the crucifixion and the resurrection together. They are two sides of the same coin. An angel appears like lightning. The audience is reminded that Jesus said that the coming of the human one would be like lightning in the sky. The soldiers faint out of fear, becoming like dead men. The script has been flipped again. Jesus is alive, and the soldiers are like dead men. But not really dead, just like dead men, because this is a nonviolent gospel. The soldiers faint out of fear when the angel comes, but the women don't. They talk with the angel. They get the first tour of the empty tomb, and they are charged with being the first bearers of the message of resurrection. And then they meet the risen Jesus. This is the resurrection that the audience has been waiting for. Resurrection, as I have said previously, signified in ancient Israelite literature the final victory over the empires that had oppressed Israel. 
But in those writings, resurrection was either metaphor or it was in the future at the end of time. This is literal resurrection within history. This gospel still speaks of a future resurrection, the final victory, but Jesus' resurrection brings that future into the present. Last year, I listened to a series of Yale lectures by Christine Hayes, which are free on YouTube and which I highly recommend. She suggested that the prophetic books prior to the apocalyptic period looked for hope within history, but as time went on and Israel continued to be oppressed by one empire after another, the apocalyptic writers began to place hope in a future beyond history, in a final resurrection. I'm not fully in agreement with her on that, if I understand her correctly. I think that the apocalyptic texts are more hopeful and were relevant to their original audience's times and circumstances. But in general, she makes a good point. And that's what makes the gospel story so interesting. It comes out of that milieu. And yet, it doesn't put off all hope to a future resurrection. Rather, it tells a story of the future breaking into the present through the resurrection of Jesus. Let's continue with verses 11 to 15. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You must say, His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story is still told among the Jews to this day. We shouldn't understand the term Jews in this passage to refer to all people who today we would call Jews. This is a reference to those whose allegiance was to the political establishment in Israel that collaborated with Rome during the time of Jesus, and that, at the time of the writing of Matthew, may still have been trying to work things out with the powers of the empire, and were continuing to practice a politics of hierarchy and power. So the Sanhedrin bribes the soldiers just as they bribe Judas. As Carter observes, they try to buy off the resurrection. They have no interest in the truth. They merely want to stop the idea of resurrection. The news of this resurrection is dangerous to them. It will give the people hope and faith that is beyond their control. This is comical in a way. The thing that they were supposedly afraid of, that the disciples would steal the body, becomes the story they deceptively tell. And the story they have devised is not even a good one. If the soldiers were asleep, then how do they know the disciples stole the body? And how could the disciples not wake them up while rolling away a sealed stone? Just how soundly do these soldiers sleep? Let's continue with verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. The story ends in Galilee where it began. It has come full circle. This passion narrative has involved elements that occurred in the opening chapters of the story, such as an angel and a dream by Pilate's wife and the title King of the Jews. These were all things that were in the opening chapters of Matthew. And now it takes us back to Galilee, to an unnamed mountain. Jesus taught and healed people and was transfigured on unnamed mountains in Galilee. And now this is the sort of place where he gives his final commission to his disciples. And the last word that we get regarding these disciples is that some of them doubted. That is the last thing the narrator says about them, that some of them doubted. This is not a gospel of simple platitudes. Nothing is easy. Even after all they've been through, or maybe because of all they've been through, some of the disciples have a hard time believing. But they are gathered on this unnamed mountain. It's not Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem, 
It's not Mount Olympus, where the Roman gods live, nor is it the seven hills of Rome. It is a no-name mountain in backwater Galilee. That's where Jesus gives the Great Commission to his disciples to take the movement transnational. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Carter compares this commission to the declarations of Rome's mission to militarily dominate the world, a mission which was declared on coins and monuments, at festivals, by poets and historians. For example, Romulus, one of the mythical brothers who was said to have founded Rome, declared, Go and declare to the Romans the will of heaven, that my Rome shall be the capital of the world. So let them cherish the art of war, and let them know and teach their children that no human strength can resist Roman arms. In contrast, Jesus' commission is not about war and domination. It is about spreading the message of God's new society that he taught them, the message about a new society of justice and mercy. It is about teaching people and making all the nations disciples of this teaching and baptizing people from all the nations, giving them citizenship in the new society, under the name of the one Father that supplants and replaces all earthly fathers, and of the Son who was crucified by the empire and overcame it through resurrection, and of the Spirit which Rome drove out of him, but which has been revived with him, a Spirit which has known marginalization and suffering unto death, so that in that knowing it will make the first last and the last first, so that the whole world will be healed. Jesus' great commission is nonviolent and is embedded in his life, his teaching, his crucifixion and resurrection. It is embedded in the life of a peasant king who came to serve, who was tortured and executed by the empire, and who rose from the dead in nonviolent victory over the empire. The human one has come so that the humanity of the whole world can be healed. And thus concludes the Gospel of Matthew. My name is Bert Newton. The music for this episode has been provided by Bob Nolte and David Martin. Please spread the word about this podcast. It will remain up for quite a while. And give us ratings and reviews that will draw others to it. Thank you to everyone who has supported this podcast in all the ways that you have supported it. Questions and comments can be sent to subversivewisdom at gmail.com. This has been Bible Study for Progressives. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe to our podcast or put us in your favorites and write a five-star review. Tell your friends about us and share us on social media. Follow us on Facebook and click the donate button at modernlectionaries.blogspot.com. Your support will help us reach more people, produce more and better shows, and cover the cost of production. Feel free to send me a note or comment on the show. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, this is Rich Procida. Thank you for listening.